this inexorable machine has gotten going and will not stop. We are churning out these nuclear weapons. We're putting them in planes, flying all over the place. I told you! People were scared. Only man of God. Everybody's doing their job, and everybody's doing the right thing, and 10 million people are going to die. What do we do, Mr. Chairman? What do we say to the dead? Feel safe. Meant to have said. You've got to do it in fast. Our relatively unimportant human feelings and ideas are once this mechanism gets going. Keep receiving no matter what you hit. It builds to a perfect ending or to a frightening, frightening ending that you don't think is going to happen. Drop your bombs according to plan. We've created these murderous toys. They're going to run away with us. No! The theme of this is, is stop and think. Sixty-four would have already been the generation that, the young generation, that in the 50s had been told to sit under a desk and do this. You're still doing duck and cover drills, which I always love that idea. Get down on your knees, put your hands over your head when the nuclear bomb hits. You'll be fine. It was a time of a great deal of fear and agitation about the bomb. Seven. Johnson when he ran for pr the presidency in 64, uh, locked it up with that unbelievable commercial. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. The 64 election was very, very much centered on that, with Johnson maintaining that Goldwater was not only a hawk, but a totally irresponsible hawk. The climate was one of fear. And uh, I must say my own impression as an Irishman coming over here from Ireland was that the, the Americans seemed to be a very scared crowd. You're a traitor. You're worse than anybody. I think Americans dealt with that threat of war the way Americans deal with those things. Well, I said, first of all, you look for somebody to blame. Uh, you look for an enemy. The Russian aim is to dominate the world. They think that communism must succeed eventually if the Soviet Union is left reasonably intact. I remember being at a Giants football game. Somebody I was with say, hey, there's this book coming out that I heard about. The book had attracted a lot of attention and struck some kind of nerve, and I think that made it uh, possible. I did feel that uh, this was a good time to make this movie, and uh, it also was a good time for it to be received well. The Cuban Missile Crisis was, I believe, 62. So God knows that was a revival of it all. There was debate. I mean, there was uh, an anti-war movement. There was an anti-bomb movement. I think the timing was right for Failsafe to be made. I think Sidney felt the same way, Max felt the same, we all felt the same way. There are four real places that you tell the story from. You tell the story from the war room. Overtaken attack group six. You tell the story from the Pentagon. In this point of view, old fashioned. You tell the story from the president's bunker. It's a mistake. And you tell it from the cockpit of the plane. Check Omaha. And each of them is a very personal story. The characters in Failsafe all kind of express a point of view. That's what they're there for. We now have the capacity to blow up the whole world several times over. Black was his name. General Black. Yes, Mr. President. Rather righteous. We're talking about the wrong subject. But nevertheless, a realist at the same time. Fighting for your life isn't the same as murder. He, as the general, is the guy who says, we have to slow down. We're going too fast. Things are getting out of hand. He was your brave, honest, military man who was beginning to have qualms about what was happening. You know what you're saying. He questions. He's questioning. He's questioning himself. He's questioning what's happening. What gives us the right to live, then? What makes us worth surviving, Grotichella, that we are ruthless enough to strike first? Yes! Those who can survive are the only ones worth surviving. Walter Martha played a A-bomb theoretician who was clearly patterned after Herman Kahn. I'm a political scientist who would rather have an American culture survive than a Russian one. Khan wrote a book which, in essence, said, well, 
it's an atomic war is survivable. The point is still who wins and who loses the survival of a culture. When Sidney cast Walter Matthau, you know, he had not been an established comedian <laughs> yet. Peculiar reversal. Press would be interested. And knew that he was a wonderful actor, period. And that there's a lot that he could do. I've been making a few rough calculations based on the effect of two 20 megaton bombs dropped on New York City in the middle of a normal work day. He's so believable in this role and so dark. I'm not your kind. No, I'm not your kind. He sure. plays him straight and says, this is how you win. This is how you do it. And that's what makes him evil. Now, Mr. Secretary, now is when we must send in a first strike. The hardest thing about casting this was finding a guy who could play the president that you believe is world-weary and that you trust. Hello, Buck. How's your Russian today? Everybody in the United States would have voted for Henry Fonda for president if he had ever decided to run. If you saw him in any sort of sophisticated film, you felt he should be president. This is the president of the United States. The mission you are flying has been triggered by a mechanical failure. He brought total integrity. He brought kind of honesty that he has in his acting that comes through. You must believe me. You asked for belief at a curious time. If we don't trust each other now, Mr. Chairman, there may not be another time. There's a shot when the president is trying to find out if there's any way he can get Grady to come back. And he says, is it possible? And they take a shot of his eye. It makes the hair on the back of your arm stand up. He had to make enormous decisions. moscow has been destroyed. Drop your bombs according to plan. Thank God we had Larry Hagman, because Larry was just so superb as the translator. I'll do my best. I know you will, Buck. It's all any of us can do. Very difficult part. He's got to do it all sitting down. Neither of us wants war, <clears throat> but we must be convinced that this is uh, truly a mistake. He has to convey literally what the Russian is saying. American fighters to shoot down American bombers. That is correct. He has to tell the American president what he feels the Russian premier is feeling at that moment. His voice is different, sir. Uh, it's not angry, it's subdued. At the same time, he's got to tell us, the audience, what he's feeling. It's very, very difficult. Well, we rehearsed it like a stage play. That's the only time I ever saw Fonda as the president. Lumet had a lovely quality to him as a director, to allow the actors to play it. If he saw something that he didn't like, in a direction, he would say it and correct. But if he didn't say it, he wouldn't say anything. He said, that's nice. Now play it, but a little faster. Sidney is wonderful with actors. I think he got performances out of them. It's a hard day. Which, are, you know, which were great. The production designer was a very good guy by the name of Albert Brenner. The main room was where all the money went. The mainframe computers were enormous. Al got these boxes. And the discs on them, they could go like this and like that. That's all they could turn. We could not get a picture of Sack. We could not get a picture of the interior of Sack, where those screens were. Of course, we tried immediately to... I needed footage of bombers. And this is footage that's available from rental houses. We couldn't get anything from the government. Then we went to the rental houses, which have the stuff. And by that time, we couldn't get anything from the rental houses. Not a foot. The plane that you see in that movie was one shot that we bootlegged. The five planes that you see taking off are all the same plane. Not just that the government would not give us cooperation, they've done that before with other pictures and have done it since. But that they cut off the rental houses is extraordinary. That, in turn, led us to this very simple, almost simplistic way of portraying the invasion of Russian airspace. That footage was done for us by two great animators, John and Faith Hubley, hand animated. We were doing that because it was the simplest and least expensive way to draw it and make a little white cloud every time one of them got hit. Suddenly, this lawsuit arrived. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. He was working on Dr. Strangelove, which had been taken from a book called Red Alert. And the authors of Red Alert, Stanley and Columbia Pictures, sued the authors of Failsafe, who were two professors, 
uh, on a plagiarism basis. I remember Max at some kind of a press conference saying, you can't tell me that two professors would be guilty of plagiarism. They treated it satirically. We, we treated it straight. The two movies, Strange Love and Failsafe, have everything in common in terms of storyline and nothing in common in terms of character, intent, or style. This is the President of the United States. Do you hear me clearly? Hello, Dimitri. Listen, I, I can't hear too well. Do you suppose you could turn the music down just a little? The Russian aim is to dominate the world. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration. All I can tell you is that it's an accident. It's not an attempt to provoke war. It's not part of a general attack. Don't say that you're more sorry than I am, because I'm capable of being just as sorry as you are. So we're both sorry, all right? <laughs> Gentlemen, I am taking over command of this post. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. This one's harder to do. It's harder to do it straight. Columbia Pictures bought Failsafe in order to keep it off distribution. It wouldn't have hurt Strange Love to have a straight picture come out and then a satire. But having a satire come out first and then a straight picture hurt us. We opened to no audience whatsoever. You have to look silly after the comedy version has come out. Just when you think any other movie would now fix this, it does just the opposite. I'm up in the air in a bomber. I will fly the plane and release the bombs. Deciding to release that bomb right onto the heads of his wife and kids. There are 10 close-ups of the most ordinary street activity going on in New York. What was important to see was that the 10 little pieces of life that we had up there ended at that moment. It destroys it, and you can't believe they did it. I don't have to tell you that the disclaimer at the end was put on by Columbia Pictures. I remember saying to Leo Jaffe, who ran Columbia, why didn't you put it on Stanley's picture, too? Of course, the studio would have put on an epilogue to assure the audience that this could never happen. They'll always play it safe. Why remake Failsafe as a film? We're trying to tell a story that we think, first of all, is a really good, smart storytelling, and still holds up. But you're telling me I've been specifically ordered not to do. It's perfect. Colonel, get on the horn and give that order. It's timeless now because there are still questions about nuclear exchange, except that it's not one area you have to worry about, it's nine. Sorry we alarmed you. Russia still has, what, 18,000 nuclear missiles? We have God knows how many. This whole policy of overkill, it makes no sense. They're all based on computers, and as we all know, computers are not fail-safe, whatever they say. You know, we just had Y2K, and nothing happened. But I woke up at 6 in the morning and turned on CNN just to make sure. It's in the nature of technology. Machines are developed to meet situations. Now they take over. They start creating situations. Uh, I think all hell is going to break loose. I think there's uh, a great deal that is out of our control and getting more so. The theme that the humans make, humans can do something about this, is still very relevant. We put it there, Mr. Chairman, and we're not helpless. What we put between us, we can remove. There's a marvelous quote from Emerson. He says, things are in the saddle and ride mankind. And I always remember that, that this, this was what was happening. It still is happening. I can hear the sound of explosions from the northeast. The sky is very bright, all lit up.